So I've gone into detail about the RSC before the Royal Army Service Corps and that's on the Corgi Bedford QL video that was a few months ago but I've never gone in to proper detail about it and most people who watch the channel know how interested I am in this subject not just because I'm reading a really thick book from 1955 and I'm only on page 407 of 725 so still a long way to go but I found out a lot but most people don't actually know how it affects me and this video is actually part of a longer video but I've obviously split it up into sections the longer video will go on my other channel called Andy's Life in the very near future so take away what you will hopefully I get to see an expert very soon and the reason is is because I have these visions is it's basically like a trance and I'm seeing exactly the same thing it's usually without sound things that I cannot put my finger on one of them is when we turn out of the goods yard we turn right and that's exactly the same direction that we came we go up the hill and then it basically just cuts out so am I taking it back to a supply dump near the beaches I don't know the second thing that's confusing is the OY, the Bedford OY has a wooden body, not a steel body, and we're talking July 1944 here. So there's a few things that don't make sense, um, and I'm hoping that a hypnotherapist could shine a light on this. I've had this recurring images, as I said, slash trance since the 8th of December 2019. And I certainly don't want it to go away. I think it's a marvellous thing. But I just want to get to the bottom of it. Um, why am I seeing the exact same route, the exact same lorries? Why is it the exact same thing? Basically, I just want answers, to be honest. How come this happened? I, I don't know. Maybe because of that book. It could have been because of that book. I don't know. And then number three is basically... I don't want this to, to go out in my head. No, I'm not looking for that. But I want an explanation why is it always the same you see back in world war Two. for those who don't know and I'm, I'm sure there's a good few people watching who don't know the logistics service changed the lorries quite a lot you see they would start off with british lorries then of course lend lease came in and they shipped them direct to north africa american lorries um, mainly the mac NR series the tank transports I believe they were the very first American lorries that the RASC had then after that in Normandy you would have um, your your I think it was 10 ton NMs which of course were three axle um, general cargo configuration and then after like two three months they would swap them out for Bedford QLs and then Bedford all wise and it, it didn't make any sense. Um, it makes sense now because of maintenance issues. That makes a lot of sense. Plus, remember, in World War Two, you see, in World War Two, the trucks had a three-ton payload. So, basically, you, you could only load three tons into one truck. Could you imagine how many trucks that took to supply, say, an infantry platoon or a brigade or even a division? yeah a hell of a lot of trucks and if there's one thing that never got resolved in world war Two, there was never ever ever enough trucks especially for the british army um you would have the 21st army group of course under montgomery they need all the supplies that they could so clearly that had to be brought on trucks but then you would have um a section of that army say that would would invade um say Antwerp for instance in Belgium so what they need they need more they would need more rounds for their firearms but so would the people who were pushing into the Rhine they'd need it as well so there's clearly a compromise that would have to be made one of the sections that would not get everything they needed quite clearly plus it was a world war so you were fighting on multiple uh, multiple fronts, including Burma and the Pacific, and of course they need supplying. 
Um, and I know that in Burma they were very successful with, with her drops from Decor to Mark III's. But how would they get from the harbour to the airfield? Exactly, by lorry. So again, the demands placed on the RASC was it was it was mega. It was mega. There was never enough um, lorries to go around. And surprising, yesterday at Lytham, I found out, talking about payloads, that if you loaded all of the ammunition for the quick fire 25 pounder anti tank gun, well, I say anti tank gun is basically artillery for anything, weren't it? But they did use it on tanks. Um, in a QL, it wouldn't come up to the tilt, which means it wouldn't come up to the top of the tailgate. And they said to me that that would be um, one stack. So if you can imagine a flatbed wagon, imagine crates on there, but only one, not stacked up, that is a three ton payload. So it's like many, many friends have said to me, not only did they overload these trucks, they would have to overload them. Because you clearly cannot get one stack of supplies to, say, an infantry brigade because you didn't have enough trucks. So you would either load them all the way up to the tailgate or if you put the canvas down, you would load them all the way up to the top of the canvas. So you're overloading them. So what's the first thing to go when you overload something? Clearly the springs. And in the Western Desert, they had a lot of trouble with springs because they just, nobody thought, oh, wait a minute, we're overloading them. And you guys at the workshops, you need springs more than oil, more than lubricants, more than spur tires, more than whatever else. So the supplies were in place when the mechanics really needed them to keep these trucks on the road to keep them supplied to the people who clearly needed them. Um... <laughs> So, there you go. Um, in a nutshell, really. I do get carried away, but, you know, that's me at the end of the day. So, yeah, and I just wish I could do this on Andy's Vehicle History Channel. I wish that I could just look into the camera and just say all this. Obviously, I have. I can reuse this video if I need to. But, yeah, you know, uh, we like to go into detail. And, of course, in my opinion, the drivers of these lorries, they are the real heroes. They are the people who won the war. You can talk about your artillery gunners, your tank crews, your infantry. But without the people who drove these lorries, couldn't get them there. I know the German army, most of them, operated by horsepower. Most of their supply wagons were pulled by horses. Yep, I get that, but well, what happened to them? And horses are not as quick as um, the internal combustion engine. Um, but yeah, you know, if I can get to that hypnotherapist, then I'll be very happy to talk about all this. Hopefully he's come up with some sort of explanation. What's over the hill? Why does it keep repeating itself? Could it be possible that this is a form of life? Is is that, you know, is that it? Is that what I'm actually seeing for, for real? I don't know. So, so this is Mickey Mouse camouflage. So you can see um, where the pattern is. That's why they called it Mickey Mouse. Because it reminds them of Mickey Mouse's ears. Trucks in 1944 that obviously went over to the continent. And even the Royal Air Force had them. Because remember the RAF had their own supply section. They really relied on the RASC apart from um, in bases like Iceland for instance and the Faroe Islands and, and all the isolated outposts as they called them um, so very rarely did they um, depend on RASC so of course Royal Army Service Corps supply lines or LSC line of communication um, because they would have their own supply lines I'm not too sure how the RAF worked I don't know if they would have like 20 wagons in convoy in an echelon if it worked just like the RASC I presume it did because there is no books 
on that particular subject to do with the Royal Navy or RAF. But I know the Royal Navy did have a helping hand um, to do with munitions at the start of World War Two with the RSC, I presume, like down in Portsmouth or Plymouth, somewhere like that. Um, but again, that I don't know much about, and I'm really not going to go into that bit. So anyway, like I said, it's a recurring... Um, I want to say dream, but it actually happens when I'm awake. So it, it is like a trance. Um, when you, when I basically think of the RSC, obviously I'm reading the book. I have like eight books. Not all on the same subject. Some are World War II. Some are World War One. One is um, interwar and two are post-war. So it's just one of these things that I'm very interested in because... There's so many historians that go on about infantry and artillery and tanks. They won the war. They didn't win the war. If it weren't for these guys who drove the lorries delivering the supplies, then there you go. But that goes for all sides. So in my opinion, they are the real heroes. And call it, you know, visually immersed, call it what you will. But that's what keeps happening. And I hopefully this year aim to get to the bottom of it i don't know how long these appointments take i don't know if it's like a counseling where it's one session after another or if you can basically do it in the space of maybe an hour or two i, I don't know how it works so when i see my counselor today she already knows about this um i don't go specifically for this obviously as as you know i broke up with the last um girlfriend um, back in January and it's, it's done my head in pretty bad so I've been seeing her to do with that now now I don't feel that bad but obviously like interests or hobbies or so I basically said yeah photography I said World War Two. I explained about the RASC and I explained about these like trans states that I go into and she understood because I've told her about it like three times now, hopefully she can pass me on to somebody who's an expert, who who knows how to do hypnotherapy, and then we can once and for all conclude what's happening. Paddy did say it's something called REM sleep disorder. Now I looked that up the other day. 